race was the most effective way to advance diversity, and now everything else is just sort of second best. It's not really um, going to achieve it in the same way. With a 6-3 conservative-led vote in the University of North Carolina case and a 6-2 vote in the Harvard case due to Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson recusing herself, the Supreme Court of the United States opposed affirmative action. Today, WUVA spoke with UVA law professors Deborah Hellman and Kimberly Robinson about the changes in universities derived from this impactful ruling. What the decision held is that um, the university cannot consider race on its own or race qua race is what they said in admissions, but it can consider a student's individualized experience of race. I am confident because the data indicates that we are going to see a significant decline in um, students of color, particularly Hispanic and African-American students, um, possibly as well Native American students um, in selective institutions and that will mean that we have a less diverse set of leaders in our nation. While race cannot be considered solely by itself, there are still ways universities can seek diversity in the admissions process. One thing we know is there can't be boxes that you check on the application that I am a particular race. But suppose a student were to write in her essay, I'm a Latina woman, let's say, just to use an example. And that's affected me in all the usual ways that you might expect, right? So doesn't say anything in a way particular or unusual about her experience, but also makes it about her, right? Can a, a um, school take that into account? Or is that the bad kind of race qua race versus the good kind? So this isn't even how would we police it, just what counts as doing the thing you're permitted versus doing the thing you're not permitted. And I don't think that's clear at all. Colleges and universities should not just give up and throw their hands up and say, oh, well, we can't promote diversity anymore. Mm -hmm. There's an array of factors that universities can look at. So that can be anything from socioeconomic status, um, multiple languages in the home, increasing focus on making sure that communities of color um, and really just diverse communities across the board, rural communities, low-income communities, just make sure that everyone is uh, included in recruiting. I know that UVA, for example, just had its largest, most diverse class admitted ever. So yeah. like having students come to ground and see this is a place that is welcoming and inviting and where you can thrive. I think that goes a long way. This decision may also have long-term effects in professional areas influenced by higher education. To the extent that it affects who's studying in elite institutions, I think it's likely to affect lots of other segments of society. It's going to have a big impact on the pipeline for lawyers, doctors, engineers, um, teachers, just any pathway that goes through a selective college, which is, you know, most of the leaders in our society. There are, there's a lot of data showing that um, the people who go to these elite and selective institutions are those that are kind of disproportionately holding positions of power. How much does race matter in college admissions? I think the majority on the court that wanted to get rid of affirmative action want people to stop thinking so much about their identity in racial terms. They want, they think that if we don't have that box checking, we're going to sort of move to a world in which we don't focus so much on race. Chief Justice Roberts said this in an early opinion, the way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. This idea that at this critical moment of selection, we would suddenly go colorblind mm -hmm. really overlooks the colorized nature, the racial nature of the entire system. I mean, the entire system is is infused with race. And so to think that we should then at the end of it now go colorblind just really flies in the face of just the historical and present reality of how K-12 education works. Mm -hmm. There are challenges that this decision presents, but there is still hope for diversity in colleges and universities. I think the future is uncertain. Um, it's uncertain in two respects. One is 
what this distinction between race, qua race versus race of it as experience is going to mean in practice. And the second uncertainty, there are litigants already challenging the adoption of race neutral policies if those policies are adopted with the aim of increasing racial diversity. And we should not uh, just assume that those kinds of race neutral policies that are aimed at increasing racial diversity are immune from legal challenge. My hope is that universities and colleges, selective universities and colleges will really come together to uh, look at ways that they can promote diversity with consistent with the law. It will take a large investment of resources, time and energy, and that is gonna be just really critical to helping our nation not go backwards, like not dramatically drop off in the diversity that exists. So I think that is just really important for universities to understand that they seem, there seems to be discussion that they do understand the need for that, and so I think that that will happen. After speaking to the law professors, it's clear that there are many nuances that need to be clarified and adjustments that need to be made to colleges regarding how they conduct future admissions processes. I'm Aithi Goginani, WUBA. Thank you.